your response to me will be confidential. But I would like you to be as completely honest as you can be regarding your contribution to the project and your partner's contributions to the project. It will be figured in to your grade. So I will be looking at all partners' responses. I don't know how yet. I have to look at it. The cop-out, quite honestly, would be for everybody to say everybody gets equal points. If that's really the way it was, OK. But if your group did not do exactly equivalent uh, work on these, then that's not the best way to do it. So I need you to be thinking about, you and your group members, how many points to assign each other. And yes, that is a hard thing to do. It is something you will be asked to do frequently once you leave college. What if the, uh, the group members don't agree on how much work? It's not agreement of the group members. It's you deciding how to divide the points for your group. You are now the group leader for your group. Each one of you is now the group leader for your group, and you are assessing your group. So you don't have to come to an agreement. This is just you evaluating the members of your group. If you'd like, you can get together and discuss it, but it is not required. So I did receive several emails on Friday from groups who said, wait a second, this didn't work out well. If I had been naive enough to think that every single group would work out perfectly, I would not be teaching here today. I'd be doing other activities where I get groups to do everything right the first time. Um, it doesn't happen. It's the reality of group work. And yet only two groups came to me prior to Friday to say we have a problem. So now's where it gets hard. The papers are done. I'm enjoying reading them. Uh, they are, I'm using the grading rubric I showed you. Um, I'm being rather, I don't know what the right word is, critical. Uh, the numbers are not above 90. They're not below 50. They're somewhere in between. The average right now is 80. Um, I don't know what I'll do with it when I'm all done. I expect an average of between 85 and 90 when I'm done with the paper. You guys worked hard on it. It's obvious. So I may actually have to tweak my scores, which I won't do for a test, but I may do for, uh, for this. So after I'm all done grading, I'll decide what to do, but I'm not done yet. Right now, my spreadsheet, by the way, is set up so that um, I've given each of your papers a different name. So when I, uh, when I pull it up on screen, it just says paper one, paper two, paper three. I then go into the spreadsheet and identify and grade the paper without students' names on it. But on the second page of the spreadsheet, it lists all the names. And so it just looks up your score. So I'm trying to do it as cleanly as I can without knowing whose paper I'm reading. Obviously, I know um, there's a couple recurring themes in them. Stem cell research was popular. Sleep deprivation was popular. Alcoholism was popular. Uh, I'm trying to think if there were any others. So I am going to need the board, ladies. Jessica, I'm sorry. This thing's not working right. So I need the boards. It's, I'm not sure what's up with the computer, but we're going to have to use the boards. <laughs> Contrary to what, um, oh, don't forget, you have another opportunity a week from Thursday. I realize that Wednesday you have an opportunity in another one of your classes. Uh, so most of you have, a, have that class before this one on Wednesday. I'll try not to kill you Wednesday, but uh, there will be some things in here. Um, we are moving on to other equilibrium things. I'll do that in a second. If you remember when we first introduced the equilibrium constant, I said to you there are about eight or nine different equilibrium constants that are all essentially the same thing. It's the, the amount of product race to a stoichiometric coefficient divided by the amount of reactant race to a stoichiometric coefficient. If the value of the equilibrium constant is very large, you get lots of product. 
if the value of the equilibrium constant is very small, you don't get a lot of product. We've talked about KQs and KCs and KPs, KA, KB, and KW. Now we've got two more, KSP and KF. And they're related to each other, but they are going to throw a curveball at you. Today we want to talk about KSP, but then Wednesday we'll go into the KFs, and, and I'll show you what I mean. The best way to do it is this way. Now that the screen's down, let's see what we've got. That's good enough. All right. In both of these beakers, I'm going to put some sodium chloride. I have, it looks like 0.5 molar NaCl. And then into the first one, the one on the, l the right, I don't know my right from my left, I'm going to add some silver nitrate. What's the solubility rule for chlorides? All chlorides are soluble except, ah, silver. I had sodium chloride, so I had a soluble compound. I have silver nitrate, all nitrates are soluble, but we add a little bit of silver nitrate to this. And you're not seeing a thing, so that's boring as all get out. I don't know that the screen will help, but go ahead, kill the light. Are you gonna bring the screen down too? That's fine. Ah, uh, the autofocus is screwing me up again. There's white chunks. Yes, there are white chunks floating around in it that weren't there before. If I add one more drop, The problem with most crystalline solids is that they're white. In order to get you a nice bright yellow one, I have to change to a carcinogenic compound. I'd rather not do that. <laughs> I deal with it regularly, but that's okay. That's right. You get to play with the carcinogens in organic chemistry. Yay! Let's get to organic, right? Get through, get through 106 first, right? And in 305? Ooh, all the more reasons to be a chem major, more carcinogens. Of course, that's better than the teratogens you get in biology. All right. Depending on, never mind. This is a little bit of lead nitrate. And you get the same kind of reaction. We're going to get some kind of a white solid in there. It's just, it doesn't clump together as nicely as the silver. It's a nice billowy cloud. It is. The silver clumps together a lot more. Silver chloride is a lot more of a compact crystal than the lead, but you can see that there's this stuff floating in there. We learned the solubility rules, but now what we want to look at is What happens when you react them together? We know that if we mix silver ions with chloride ions, we're going to get silver chloride forming. And we just added a couple drops and it happened. So what do you think is the magnitude of the K value for this reaction? Is it large or small? It's big. We got lots of product. It formed very quickly. Okay? And the thing about KSP is it talks about how readily something dissolves. Not how likely is it to precipitate, but how easily will it dissolve. 
So KSP reactions are written the reverse of the way we normally do the reactions. So that silver chloride, when I put it into an aqueous solution, may or may not dissociate into its ions, depending upon the value of K. For this reaction, if we write the solubility product expression, do we have to worry about the solid? No. Why not? What is the concentration of any solid? Constant. Not necessarily one, but it's constant. Uh, the, the example I give usually is if I take this piece of chalk and I want to determine its concentration, all I have to do is determine its mass, convert that to a number of moles, measure its volume, one, two, it's about three inches long, it's about a quarter inch in diameter, it's a cylinder, I can calculate its volume, and so I can figure out its concentration. What's the concentration of this half of that piece of chalk? Exactly the same thing. I've now cut the mass in half, but I've cut the volume in half too. So the concentration hasn't changed. I got pretty close to half. The point is that for any solid compound in an equilibrium reaction, the concentration is going to remain constant forward and reverse reaction, so we don't have to worry about it. I missed. And so the cal solubility product constant expression for any solid compound is not going to include those solids. In the case of silver chloride, if I remember right, it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10, or 4.2. Silver chloride, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. Since that number is so small, silver chloride does not dissolve very easily to give you silver ions and chloride ions. So if I mix silver ions and chloride ions, I push it back to the left and I get a precipitate forming. So a typical question would be to ask you, what is the molar solubility of silver chloride? Last week, um, we changed, uh, I can't remember what it stood for, never mind. So start with the balance equation. I don't care about the solid. When I first start, there is neither of these. Silver chloride will dissolve in water to give you some ions. Get your calculator off for me. Would you get your Four. Check me and see if I'm right. Ah, so you were closer than me. All right. What is this? I mean, you just solve for x. What is x? When we were talking about acids and bases, we go back to the table and it says x was usually the hydrogen ion concentration. We could get the pH or the pOH from it. But if we go back to the table this time, x is either the chloride ion concentration or it's the silver ion concentration. Have we answered the question yet? What is the molar solubility 
of silver chloride. What does molar solubility mean? What concentration of silver chloride will dissolve in solution? Molar solubility, if you just define the words, molar tells you how many moles, solubility, how much of it dissolves. So the question is asking, how much silver chloride dissolves when I put it into solution? Anybody know the answer yet? Go ahead. 1.3 times 10 to the negative fifth moles per liter. Why? Where did those X moles of chloride ion come from? Where did those X moles of silver ion come from? Silver chloride. So for every one mole of silver chloride that dissociates, you get one mole of silver ions or, and one mole of chloride ions. So the molar solubility of silver chloride is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per liter. So if I have half a liter, how much silver chloride, how many moles of silver chloride will I get in the solution? Half of that number, 0.65 times 10 to the minus 5 moles of silver chloride will be dissolved in there. So I can figure out how many moles of the silver chloride dissociated, how many ended up in solution. What really makes this a pain, which one do I want to pick? Here's another compound, silver sulfate. It ends up that lots of silver compounds are insoluble. The question I'm going to ask you is, which is more soluble, silver chloride or silver sulfate? I'm not asking you before you jump to conclusions which has a larger KSP. I'm asking you which one's more soluble. Which one is going to produce more, more of the compound, the starting material will dissolve in the water. So I'm asking you which one has a greater molar solubility? Well, we already know the molar solubility of silver chloride is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5. Do the exact, the exact same thing now for silver sulfate. Except now you've got a divalent sulfate ion and a monovalent or univalent silver ion. So you get two silver ions for every one sulfate ion. As always, I don't care about the solid. We're going to assume there's none of that initially. Now you've got to remember that for every one silver sulfate you start with, you get two silver ions and one sulfate ion. So that's what our equilibrium amounts will be. KSP is simply going to be the product, concentration of the products raised there, stoichiometric coefficient, divided by, we don't care about the solid.
So we get 4x cubed. And since it looks like an algebra problem, we'll just solve for x. It doesn't look right to me, Jessica. Right, right. That's what I was doing. Okay. Just testing my math skills. <laughs> so what does that tell me? What ion concentration is much higher? We've just solved for x. There's a reason why I keep saying go back to the table. What does x tell you? It tells you the sulfate ion concentration is point, .015. What's the silver ion concentration going to be? Twice that, .030. What is the molar solubility? In other words, how many moles of silver sulfate will dissolve in one liter of solution? 0.015, that number. For, in order to produce one mole of sulfate ions, I have to dissolve one mole of silver sulfate. So X happens to work out to be, again, the molar solubility. So which one is more soluble, silver sulfate or silver chloride? In which one do you dissolve more of the solid material? Silver sulfate, significantly more. So it's much more soluble than the silver chloride. What if I mix them together, Joshua? Uh, when you say it dissolves, uh, 0.015 moles dissolve in one liter of solution? Yes. What is the solution? What is the solution? My bad habit coming through. There are aqueous solutions. This is water solubility. This is what, how much of it will dissolve in water solution. So what's, what's the water? Silver sulfate. Take solid silver sulfate and dump it in water. Does it matter how much water you have? Yeah, it will. Well, we'll come to that. I'm sorry? Earlier we talked about solubility rules and when are things soluble or insoluble. If we take a soluble compound, for example, what? You put sodium chloride into water. You can already tell me the value of this KSP. What is the value of KSP for this reaction? Anybody want to hazard a guess? One? Is the concentration of the products equal to the concentration of the reactants? Well, the concentration of the reactants don't matter. Sodium chloride is soluble. So if we were to calculate this value, KSP for this, is the sodium ion concentration times the chloride ion concentration, okay? It's a very large number. All of the sodium chloride is going to dissolve. So for soluble compounds, you've got a very large value of KSP. In fact, we don't even bother reporting it. It's a strong electrolyte. It's just like strong acids. What's the Ka value for HCl? essentially infinity. 
because it completely dissociates into its ions. Yes, there might be a small bit of HCl that's left undissociated because of strong interactions between the hydrogen ions and chloride ions, but that number in the denominator is going to be so tiny that we don't have to worry about it. Same thing's true of sodium chloride. So how do you know if something's soluble or not? By looking at the value of Ksp. If Ksp is a small number, is it soluble or insoluble? What would you mean? Insoluble. If it's a large number, you get a soluble compound. So what's the boundary? I don't know. How small is small? Well, you won't be able to see this real clear, but I'll put it up there. Before I do that, and shh, shh. Mm, no. I need my lab coat, don't I? How small is small? Here's the table from your book. Look over here, I know, it's hard to see. That's 10 to the minus 33. That's small. 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the, mi 10 to the minus 72. That's small. The biggest number up here, here's 10 to the minus 51, which you can't see. Right there, silver sulfide, 10 to the minus 51. Uh, the biggest number on this table is, here's 10 to the minus 54. 10 to the minus 4, I think, is the biggest number I can find. That's lead chloride. We already said all chlorides are soluble except silver, mercury, and lead. None of them are, is it possible for it to be zero? You'd have to have absolutely no dissociation for it to be zero. They just approach zero. How close do they get? Even if it's 10 to the minus 58, <laughs> which one was that? Here's 54, 51, here's 50, let's go 54. Mercury sulfide, 4 times 10 to the minus 54. This one I can do in my head. The molar, molar solubility of mercury sulfide is 2 times 10 to the minus 27. So 2 times 10 to the minus 27 moles of sil mercury sulfide will dissolve when you put it in water. So if I take one mole of mercury sulfide and put it into water, I'm going to get 2 times 10 to the minus, in a liter of water, I'm going to get 2 times 10 to the minus 27 moles of mercury sulfide, mercury ions and sulfide ions. How many mercury ions is that? <laughs> this one? Yeah. That's 2 times 10 to the minus 27. Is it one over, one over five hundredth of an atom? Well, let's figure it out. I mean, we can. We already know the molar solubility. This tells me that, for what, if I put one mole of HGS into a liter of water, I'm going to get two times ten to the minus twenty-seven moles of mercury ions. Everybody see that part? I mean, that's just like that up there. If I take this exact same table and instead of silver chloride, I do it for mercury sulfide. The equilibrium table is exactly the same. For every mole of mercury that I make, I get one mole of sulfide. So I solve for Ksp. Okay. 
And so that's where I figured, solved this problem. That's how I did that one. So X is 2 times 10 to the minus 27. That's the concentration of mercury ions in this solution. Well, we said, assume we start with one mole. In dissolved in one liter. The number of mercury ions is 2 times 10 to the minus 27 moles per liter. We started with a liter of it. We have to go all the way back and remember Avogadro's number. 6 times 10 to the 23rd ions per mole. I did my math right, it tells me that there are 12 times 10 to the minus 4 ions per mole. Can I have a 10 to the minus 4 ion? No, I can't have a fraction of an ion. So what that's telling me is that if I have to multiply this thing by, if I multiply it by 1,000, I'm going to get 1 1.2 times 10 to the minus 1 moles, or 0.12 moles, right? So multiply by 10,000. tells me that if I take one mole of mercury sulfide and I put it into 10,000 liters of water, I will get one, uh, 12 ions. It's not very soluble. Yes, it approaches zero. Will I still get some? Again, remember this is a statistical. All chemical reactions are statistical in nature. If I start with one mole, will I perhaps get one? In one chance out of every, whatever that is, 10,000, I will get an ion. Other times I won't. So mercury sulfide is not very soluble. The nice thing about mercury sul mercaptans is they stink terribly. They have a terrible aroma. They're put into natural gas so that you can smell when there's a leak. As soon as you smell this stuff, you'll know it's there. Rotten eggs. It's going to be there. You will f know that you have a leak in the gas. And it doesn't take much for you to sense it. It just, this is, infinitely small. So yeah, it's how small is small? I've never seen a value lower than that one, but they could exist. Now, nobody complained when I did this, which is not normal. All I can attribute it to is you're all still relaxed after break. Here I have a 2x. Here I square it. Haven't I double counted it? It looks to me like I double counted it. Not only did I say I get twice as many silver ions as silver sulfate I start with, but then I square that number. So I get this 4x squared number in there. You know, after 25 years of looking at this, I still can't explain why that's true. I've come to accept it that as long as I follow the process, I can do this, but I can't explain to you why I'm not double counting. I haven't come up with a good explanation of it. If any of you do, please tell me, because I, I'd love to be able to explain to you why it's not double counting. I trust that it works. You have an idea. It's to account for things like one partially It's to account for one, uh, is it to account for things that are only partially dissociated? Possibly, but I haven't come up with a good explanation for that yet either. Why do you need it when you have divalent ions, but you don't need it for univalent ions? That's why it doesn't make sense. That's why I, I, I haven't been able to come. And it gets really bad if I give you something like, um, see if they give me a value for it. There it is. Uh, calcium phosphate.
go away here. Calculate the molar solubility of calcium phosphate, Ca3PO4 twice. KSP is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 26. So really what I'm asking is how many moles of calcium phosphate dissolve in a liter of solution? And you can already see what the problem is going to be, I bet. I'm getting, I don't have any univalent ions. They're all polyvalent. So now you plug this into your KSP expression. We've got a cube term and a squared term in this one. So this equals 3x cubed, 2x squared. Let's see, that's 27x to the third. This is 4x squared. So that's 108x to the fifth. I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, so it, it, to me that makes sense. You're doing one x to the first, but that doesn't seem like double counting. That's right, you're going to get the same thing. It only bothers me when it's squared and cubed like this. You never have to worry about going beyond cubed. There are no ions that I can think of that are tetravalent off the top of my head. That will change when we start talking about formation constants, but for right now, we don't have to worry about them. So you solve for x in this. x It's just math at this point. Heck, even Butler could do this. And so now it's just algebra. Plug it into your calculator. If you don't know how to do the fifth root on your calculator, Jessica can tell you. Uh, 2.6 times 10 to the minus 6. 2.6 times 10 to the minus 6. Five math, right? Five math, five. Five math button, five. So 2.6 times 10 to the minus 6. What is the molar solubility of calcium phosphate? How many moles of calcium phosphate dissolve when you put it into a liter of water? 2.6 times 10 to the minus 6. X will always be your molar solubility. No matter what the charges on the ions are, X will always be your molar solubility. So it's just a matter of solving for X. Everybody okay with all that? Mary? Why don't I multiply x by which coefficient? Why don't I multiply it by which coefficient? I want to know the molar solubility of that. So what is the coefficient in front of that? So I do multiply it by the coefficient. If I want to know what is the concentration of calcium ions at equilibrium, then it's going to be three times that number, right? At equilibrium, there are 3x calcium ions in the solution. And since x is in molarity, there are 3x moles per liter calcium ions. There's 2x moles per liter of phosphate ions. The reason that's going to become important is this.
Yasher asked me, what is the solution? When we calculated the molar solubility over there, we said, what is what, the solution we're talking about is what? And we said, water solution. Now, calculate the molar solubility of silver chloride in 10th molar sodium chloride solution. So I've got sodium chloride solution, and not water, and I add silver chloride to it. Will the molar solubility be greater or less than in water solution? Why less? Le Chatelier's principle. Common ion effect, if you want. That now is my equilibrium that I'm worried about. My initial concentrations, again, it's a solid, I don't care. When I dump silver chloride solid into the sodium chloride solution, there are no silver ions initially. However, because it's a sodium chloride solution, there are chloride ions. And because it's a strong electrolyte, the concentration of chloride ions equals the concentration of sodium chloride. What's going to happen? If you calculate Q at this point, what's Q equal to? Q, remember, is the value of the equilibrium constant at any time whatever concentrations you've got. K is only true at equilibrium, but Q is true any time. So Q is going to be equal to the silver ion concentration times the chloride ion concentration. Zero. There are no silver ions. Is Q greater than, less than, or equal to K? Less than. We're not at equilibrium, therefore. Which way is the reaction going to go? Left to right or right to left? <coughs> left to right. We're going to make some of these. Oops, 0 0.1 plus x. Oh, silver chloride's up there still, isn't it? Yep, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. Well, you can solve this one exactly if you want, or you can take the shortcut. Is x a small or large number? Very small number. When you add it to point 0.1, it's not going to change point 0.1. So x is that. Divide both sides by point 0.1. Is the molar solubility greater or less than what it was up there? It's significantly less. Up there it was 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5. Here it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 9. It's 10,000 times less in a chloride ion solution. Now, before you bug out, here's the lead chloride. Let me get the screen out of the way. There's the lead chloride. I'm going to drop some concentrated HCl into it. And whatever solid was in there is no longer in there. Wednesday, you've got to explain to me why. There's none in there. I'll see you on Wednesday. A little bit. <laughs>